Hey everyone, this video is the first in a set of videos on the topic of cognitive biases, tribalism, and politics. You can click on the video thumbnail at the end to go to the next video in the series. I got this question in my email last week. What's the most important cognitive bias to be aware of from the standpoint of someone who wants to think critically about politics? It's a good question. You know what my mind goes to when I hear this question? My mind goes to what Scott Adams has called the two movies phenomenon. We watch the same events like a Trump speech or the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, but people of different political persuasions interpret those events so differently, it's like they're watching two different movies projected onto the same screen. We think we're all watching the same movie, but half the audience is really watching one movie and half is watching another. But we don't realize we're watching different movies until we compare notes about what we just watched. And when we do compare and become aware of the mismatch, we think there must be something strange or wrong with the people who saw a different movie than we did. We see this all the time in the running social media commentary that accompanies any of these polarizing media events. The caravan at the Mexican border is the most recent example at the time that I'm making this video. I'd really like to understand this phenomenon better, so I'm going to restate the question this way. Are there cognitive biases operating that can help us understand the two movies phenomena? Now, I do believe that the last sketchbook video I did on tribalism and trust tells part of the story. Our tribal judgments are, in large part, the product of a combination of affect bias and cultural cognition. You should watch that video to get the full story, but here's the gist. Affect bias says that our feelings drive our perception of risk, how we judge things in terms of benefits and costs or risks. If I feel positively about something, I'll tend to judge the benefits as high and the risks low. If I feel negatively, I'll go the other way. So if you can manipulate people's feelings about a thing, you'll change the way they reason and process information about that thing. Now, what's cultural cognition? Cultural cognition says that the cultural values that we identify with, our beliefs about the right way to organize society, drive our feelings and judgments about issues that have become culturally polarized, that, for various reasons, have become entangled with those cultural values. Dan Kahan and his colleagues have shown that this combination of affect bias and cultural cognition is strongly predictive of how people will feel and reason about social issues that have become politicized and polarized, like climate change, like gun control, abortion, immigration, terrorism, sex and gender, and so on. So all of this is obviously important for understanding how tribal psychology affects our political views. But there's another cluster of biases that adds another important dimension to the story. These biases influence our perceptions about the compatibility or incompatibility of different political values. We have a strong tendency to think of political values in terms of oppositional pairs. Liberal versus conservative. Individual rights versus group rights. Freedom versus regulation. Nationalism versus globalism. Religious values versus secular values. We structure our thinking along these oppositional alignments where we come to feel not only that we have to pick sides, but that in choosing one side, we have to diminish or discredit the values espoused by the other side. But none of this is true. We can care about more than one thing and more than one kind of thing at the same time. We do it all the time. When I exercise to improve my health or to look better, I'm caring about my own welfare, my own self-interest but I also care about the welfare of family and friends for their own sake, not just for my sake. These are different kinds of values. And I can care about the welfare of strangers. That's a different value again. I care about pain and suffering. All other things being equal, I think it's a good thing to reduce pain and suffering when we can. But I also care about duties and responsibilities and obligations. Again, these are different kinds of values, but they matter to me too. I care about individual rights and freedoms, but I also care about the public good and the good of communities. And I care about the traditions and norms that bind communities together. I care about equality and fairness, 
but I also care about historical inequalities and systematic discrimination. That matters to me too. I care about whether my actions are right or wrong, but I also care about the moral quality of my character, whether I'm a good person or not. Again, different kinds of values. There's a name for this ability to care about and be motivated by different types of values. It's called value pluralism. Or, to be more specific, what I'm describing here is called psychological value pluralism. Because we're talking about the psychological capacity to be moved and motivated by different types of values. I think it's clearly true that, under this description, we're all psychological value pluralists of one stripe or another. As a mental model, I like to think of these different value orientations like channels on an equalizer. We each have a value channel profile as part of our psychological makeup. The different bars represent the different kinds of values that we can respond to. If you're set high on a given channel, that indicates that you're more sensitive to those value considerations. They're more salient in your own moral and political thinking. If you're set lower, then you're less sensitive to those kinds of values. Different people will have different value profiles because we vary in the sorts of values that matter to us and how much we care about those values. And the shape of the value channel profile for a single person can change in different contexts and different situations. Our profile might look very different when we're at home with our families in a domestic context than when we're at work or in a more public context interacting with strangers. So there's lots of variation in our moral psychology. It varies between people and it even varies within people. But the point is that normal human adults are capable of responding to and being motivated by many different types of values. Now, before we move on, I should clarify something. I'm talking about psychological value pluralism. Philosophical value pluralism is a very different thing. It's one thing to say that I value something intrinsically. That is, I value something for its own sake, not for the sake of something else. This is a descriptive claim. It's a claim about our psychology, our attitudes, the way we value something. It's quite another thing to say that something is intrinsically valuable, because that implies that a thing is worthy of being valued for its own sake. That is a normative claim. Because a thing is valuable, I ought to value it. This is a philosophical claim. You might even call it a metaphysical claim about the nature of value itself and how many different kinds of value there are in the world. Philosophers have been debating this philosophical issue about the nature and status of moral and political values for centuries. For example, there is a long debate between what are called moral monists, who think that all moral values are reducible to one super value, and moral pluralists, who think there are distinct irreducible moral values. It's an interesting debate, but it's not relevant to what I'm talking about here. When we're talking about how cognitive biases or other psychological or social factors causally influence our attitudes and our judgments, it's the descriptive facts that we're concerned with, how we actually perceive and think about value, not the philosophical status of the concept of value itself. Now, with this setup under our belt, in the next video, we can talk about this other cluster of cognitive biases that, I will argue, plays an important role in explaining how people of different political orientations perceive and experience the world so differently.